Hello, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the uh, wait room for the Stress Urinary Incontinence webinar. Uh, thank you for your time and thanks for attending. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes for some more um, participants before we get started. Okay, good evening once again, everyone. And thank you for attending this seminar or webinar on stress urinary incontinence. I am Dr. Riyad Gafoor. I'm a consultant urologist in Kingston, Jamaica. I'm formally trained in minimally invasive surgery and renal transplant surgery. These are my... Um, professional disclosures there that are relevant to this topic. So do you experience the involuntary loss of urine when you laugh or sneeze or cough or exercise? If so, then you may suffer from stress urinary incontinence. And those are the mild symptoms. It can be even more severe and you can have escapage of urine when you stand or bend over even when you are walking. This really happens because of an increased pressure on your urethra, which is has to do with your tube from the bladder that leads to the outside that you empty your bladder through. And when the muscles and support structures that would normally hold the urine up become weak or they relax momentarily, the urine is then able to escape. If you're white, you're more likely to have this than if you're of black or Asian persuasion. But relative, but almost every single ethnicity has suffered from this. You're even more likely to have experienced this if you have multiple pregnancies, suffer from obesity, if you've had 
a previous hysterectomy or any other pelvic surgeries, or if you have diabetes or neurological conditions that affect your bladder control. There are two theories that have been proposed that can describe what happens. One is urethral hypermobility, and the other is intrinsic sphincter deficiency. So in the diagram on the left, if this is your head up here and your feet here and your face is pointing this way, this is your pubic bone or the bone that you feel at the bottom of your tummy and the bladder filled with urine. And there's a muscle here at the base of the bladder that would normally keep, that would be contracted to keep the urine in. And this is the urethra, the tube through with which you eliminate urine. And you can see that there is a natural angle here. So between the bladder muscle and the angle of the tube, it contributes to control of urine. Look on the right um, image and you can see that there's been loss of that angle and the muscle is wide open. So the muscle being open refers to intrinsic sphincter deficiency and the tube losing its angle is called urethral hypermobility. So it acts more like a slip and slide and you can see that it's easy for urine to easily escape. And this happens more commonly in females because the urethra is relatively short. It's only about four centimeters long compared to in a male where it's roughly 25 centimeters long. How, does, how do we go about fixing this? Most of the techniques and approaches that we have revolve around hammocks. So hammocks are great. What do I mean by hammocks? It's just an attempt to reconstitute that angle of the urethra and thereby um, recontribute to the, the um, continent process. So schematically, this would be a hammock or a, a mesh or a sling, these terms can be used interchangeably, that wraps around the urethra and pulls it pulls it this way to reconstitute the angle that we spoke about. So if you were to see a urologist about your stress urinary incontinence, the first thing that they would ask you is about the degree of bother or how much does it affect your quality of life? Is it stopping you from going to work or playing, exercising? Does it affect your overall fitness level if you're not exercising? Are you socially isolating? And uh, generally, how many um, episodes of incontinence do you have a day? They'd also ask questions to make sure that there's nothing else going on or that there's a misdiagnosis. You may have symptoms of overactive bladder, such as frequency of micturition, meaning that you pee every two, out, two hours or more frequently, or that you have urgency. They would want to make sure there's no blood in the urine, which would signify a more sinister pathology or that you suffer from urinary tract infections, which would be better dealt with by antibiotics. We would also want to identify any predisposing factors that you may have to having stress incontinence, and we'd want to address those, for example, uncontrolled diabetes or obesity or a chronic cough. Not all factors can be addressed, it's such as multiple previous pregnancies, but we certainly would want to address those that can be. The examination would be limited to your abdomen and vagina if you're a woman. Looking for things like pelvic organ prolapse, that would be the bladder or the womb coming down into the vaginal opening that can contribute to incontinence and that would have to be dealt with at the same time. Or they would want to examine you for neurological deficiencies or disorders that could explain what you're suffering from. Most persons would want to submit you to a cough test whereby um, we're able to stress incontinence by asking you to cough. The rest of the investigations are fairly basic with a bladder ultrasound to make sure that your bladder empties properly or that there are no pelvic masses pressing on the bladder causing your symptoms. A urine analysis to rule out urinary tract infections and most likely a simple office procedure called a uroflow that requires you to pee through a meter and um, measure the strength or flow of urine and uh, in that way, ascertain whether you have any obstruction to the flow of urine. Now, the management of stress incontinence is three-tiered. 
The first one is conservative management, and it's fairly reasonable to start most people on conservative management. If you're obese, then weight loss goes a far away. And most persons will have some improvement in the number of incontinence episodes if they're able to lose uh, some weight, whether that be by surgical and, or non-surgical means, for example, gastric bypass surgery, or just by exercising and dieting. Some persons will fall back on using urinary containment measures, for example, wearing diapers or pads or urethral plugs, which basically plugs the urethra. Um, over time, this can, these can be inconvenient, they can be embarrassing, they can be uncomfortable, and they can lead to complications. <clears throat> if you're a chronic smoker, and it, this leads to a coughing issue, a chronic cough, it would probably benefit you to stop smoking and also would help your wound healing should you go on to need a surgical intervention. And certainly the control of diabetes and other chronic um, illnesses would go far away. The second mainstay of conservative management is the Kegels exercises. Um, if if we look at the pelvic floor once again from the side view, this is the front and this is your tailbone. And these are the main organs in the pelvis, the bladder, the womb, and the bowel. And there's a hammock of muscles between the tailbone and the pubic bone through which the opening of those organs comes through. And by strengthening this muscle, we're able to improve your control of those organs. And what has been shown is that with the help of a physiotherapist, most persons after six months of physiotherapy have an increase, a measurable increase in their muscle strength. And this usually results in eight persons being eight times more likely to say that they've uh, experienced a cure. On average, there's a reduction of one episode of stress incontinence per day. Now that's great for persons with mild symptoms. If you have one, two or three episodes a day, then decreasing by one is about a 50% improvement. However, um, if you have a severe symptoms and you have eight or nine episodes a day, then one, a reduction of one event is probably not gonna make a significant improvement in your quality of life. Nonetheless, we would still recommend three months of supervised pelvic floor muscle therapy as a first line treatment. It does involve a physiotherapist um, performing some vaginal manual manipulations to make sure that you're contracting and strengthening the correct pelvic muscle. And most persons may find this, or rather I should say some persons find this intrusive. In addition, long-term compliance with this is a problem. And after a few months, most persons would stop doing Kegels exercises. Nonetheless, the complication rate is fairly low. And it's been shown that if done during pregnancy, it can develop the, prevent the development of stress incontinence in the later stages of pregnancy. The second tier of management after conservative therapy is the use of pharmacological therapies or drugs. And this is really only or mostly helpful in the postmenopausal woman um, who has symptoms of vaginal dryness. And we can provide or prescribe topical vaginal creams that act as a rejuvenation. And a lot of persons do experience uh, improvements with this. The third tier of management is intervention or surgery. For those persons who have failed conservative therapy or are unwilling to go through conservative management and they want to leapfrog or to straight to intervention, we will surgery. And the mid-urethral sling is presently the most frequently used intervention in Europe and in North America for stress urinary incontinence. The results are immediate. It's almost like hitting the reverse button and patients say that they are able to regain their continence within a few days of having had surgery. It's really a 30 minute procedure on a general anesthesia where a small incision into the front wall of the vagina is made and a synthetic mesh implant that resembles a hammock is inserted 
thereby elevating the urethra and reestablishing the natural angle of the urethra that God gave you. It's really a day surgery, and most patients are back to work the following day with a fairly low level of discomfort that's easily managed with painkillers. We'll look at a short video from Boston Scientific that will demonstrate what the um, mid urethral slings are all about. Mid-urethral slings are considered the standard of care for SUI. They are supported by leading medical societies and often performed by a urologist or gynecologist. During surgery, your doctor will insert the mesh strip, known as a mid-urethral sling, under your urethra through a small incision or incisions. This sling acts like a hammock to restore the natural support to the urethra, which helps reduce the involuntary loss of urine. Mid-urethral sling. Schematically, these are the slings that are available today. So if you are looking directly at the screen um, with your legs to the bottom, the trans obturator sling is passed behind the urethra and the tape or hammock is brought through the opening in the pelvic um, bone and the tape is cut short of the skin so that you don't feel anything. The retropubic can be brought up in front of the bladder into the lower tummy. And again, the um, tape is cut as it exits the skin. The newest kit on the block is a single incision sling where there is no opening or exit for the tape. Um, and so there's only one cut into the vaginal wall. The single incision sling has the highest cure rates of all mid urethral routes. And at five years, 70% of persons will say that they're completely dry and 90% would say that they're happy with where they are now. And it's fairly durable because at 10 years, if those per persons are followed, half of them will be completely dry and 70% will say that they are happy. So these are very stringent standards to say that someone's completely dry, but I think the subjective measure of are you happy is far more accurate. Um, it has been associated with an improvement in sexual function and persons experience less incontinence while having, while they're intimate um, with the single incision sling. At the end of the day, there is no one mid urethral sling approach that is thought to be better than the others. And it comes down to surgeons experience and what they're most comfortable with. One caveat is that the sling and indeed um, all surgical interventions are contraindicated or should not be offered to persons who are planning further childbearing because of the possibility of disrupting any uh, sling that has been placed. The complications are fairly low. The most common being acute urinary retention or stoppage of urine that can be transient or it can be long lasting. And for the transient ones that it will disappear roughly within a day or two after surgery. But if it persists, then it can be addressed or fixed relatively simply by repositioning or reinserting the sling. The next most common complication is the development of new overactive bladder symptoms, that is urgency or frequency of urination. The bladder injury is more common with the retropubic mesh than the single incision sling. And um, urinary tract infections can happen. Um, but they're usually treated easily with antibiotics. At the end of the day, the single incision sling has been shown to uh, result in less thigh pain and sexual discomfort than the other approaches. And in addition, the operative time is less, blood loss is decreased, and the post-op pain is improved. I'd like to take a little breather now as we move from the minimal procedures to the more uh, intrusive procedures like open surgery. So just to take a break like Baloo the Bear here before we move on. So when we talk about open surgeries or even laparoscopic, which is a keyhole surgery, they've been around for roughly 60 years or so. And historically up to 20 years ago, the culpo suspension was the most common procedure done for stress incontinence. It's since been replaced by the less invasive mid urethral sling approaches, and it does uh, have a lower success rate 
than the urethral sling. It is a major surgery involving a cut into the lower abdomen and the front of the vagina is then sutured to the back of the pubic bone in order to lift the bladder neck upwards. It's not for everyone, but I would offer to the woman who is unwilling to have a mesh insertion or if they're having another abdominal surgery at the same time for another reason. If they've failed a previous mid urethral sling surgery or they cannot have a vaginal approach for the MUS because of uh, trauma to the vaginal area or having received pelvic radiation or fistulation or any other complication. Who should not have it are those who been, do not demonstrate a hypermobile urethra because it won't help them or if they have pelvic organ prolapse at the same time, so the bladder or the womb may be coming down into the vagina because they would need a different approach. And again, those persons who are planning other pregnancies. Um, if we were to look, if you were to look down at your feet while standing and while having your x-ray vision, um, you would see the inside of your pelvis. And again, I'll show you your bladder. This is the bladder looking down and the vagina. And what we would do is suture uh, the front wall of the vagina to the pubic bone, thereby pulling the urethra upwards and recreating the angle that we so desire. The cure rates are similar to the mid urethral sling at about 70% but the fail rates are slightly higher at about 20% or one in five at five years. The laparoscopic approach is less invasive and patients do go home earlier, but it is associated with higher complication rates and lower cure rates. <clears throat> the complications include the new onset of overactive bladder symptoms, the failure to stop stress incontinence. Some patients may have painful intercourse and the pain from the sutures that are embedded in the pubic bone. The second open procedure is the autologous sling or the pubovaginal autologous sling. Uh, it is similar to the mid urethral sling in terms of placing a hammock beneath the urethra, but it is an open surgery that goes through the abdomen again. It uses the patient's own tissue and not a mesh it's technically more difficult, so inherently is associated with a higher complication rate. However, the cure rate is higher than culpo suspension. Um, the fact that the range of success rates is wide from 45 to 90% reported uh, speaks more to the complexity of the procedure and the surgeon's experience of those doing the procedure. Um, urinary tract infections are more common as is the complaint of urgency. Looking back down into your pelvis, you can see that we've raised a bit of muscle here, uh, your anterior abdominal wall muscle, which is right here. We've taken a bit of that tissue and passed it beneath the urethra, um, thereby once again, pulling it forwards. <clears throat> the complications of the autologous sling are similar. Um, but there are some differences. Uh, you may have a herniation of the abdominal wall. Again, you may have painful intercourse, um, vaginal or groin pain, and the injury to any surrounding structures like the bladder. And patients, once again, do have pain from the sutures. Uh, it is advantageous uh, versus the other procedures in that there's no risk of erosion because you're not using uh, a mesh, all of the mesh has a very low rate of erosion, it still can happen. Uh, it's more durable than the previously described called culpo suspension. It is a good option after a failure complicated mid urethral sling insertion as a salvage procedure, or for those persons undergoing reconstruction of the vagina after trauma who've lost some length of the urethra, those who have poor wound healing from radiation of the pelvis, and in those persons who must endure long-term catheterization um, for neurological illnesses um, because of the risk of mesh erosion with the repeated daily catheterization. 
Finally, we turn our attention to the use of bulking agents. This is just a polyacrylamide hydrogel, or just basically a very a watery substance that's injected around the urethra to form a cushion, thereby compressing the urethra from the outside in. And I'm sure you can appreciate that by compressing it, you must offer some resistance to the pathway of fluid. Um, technical or theoretically, it should work, but in, result, in, in, in practice, the results are not that good. And only one in five persons do report some uh, improvement in their incontinence. But it can be offered to women who want a low risk procedure. I don't want to run the risks of the other um, described procedures. Um, but with the caveat they, that they understand that they will need repeated applications because we don't know how long uh, the results are durable for. Nonetheless, the complication rate is fairly low and includes urinary tract infections. So we've talked about a number of approaches and um, it is clear that stress incontinence is a common complaint. It varies in its incidence from population to population, but as I said, there's virtually no uh, community that is immune to it. It impacts women in their physical activities, their sexual activities, and their social activities, thereby affecting their physical fitness, their relationships, and their quality of life. Conservative management can be offered, and it is successful in many persons, and it should be offered um, before surgery or even as an adjoint uh, intervention for those who do plan to go ahead to have, and have surgery. The minimally invasive procedures of mid-urethral slings are safe, they're effective, and they are available. Uh, they have withstood the test of time. They've been around for 20 years, and we know the complication rates are low and that the results are durable. And hundreds of thousands, if not more, of women have undergone these procedures. It is presently the most commonly used procedure for this condition. There is a place for open surgeries, but it's generally reserved for persons with more complicated um, instances of stress incontinence. But at the end of the day, I'm here to tell you that you no longer need to suffer in silence. And we are able to offer you the ability to regain control of your incontinence and of your bladder. So I thank you for your attention. And um, I do believe that we've got some questions that um, from the audience that we'd like to address. So the first question that is coming up is, does the sling have an expiration and do the procedure again? I think what they're asking is how durable is the sling? Um, so if, if there is no complication with the sling insertion and you there's not been a mesh erosion, which is fairly rare and it's usually a technical error and not due to this, the innate properties of the mesh itself. It's just a complication that happened during surgery. Um, if that hasn't happened and you are happy and you had very good results, there's really no reason to do a repeat procedure. Um, so this is essentially there for life. If it is working and there's no complication, there's no need to redo it or take it out, and there is no expiration date on it. Um, as we've said before, uh, the durability of the, res of the effects has also been measured, and roughly seven out of 10 persons at 10 years uh, say that they are happy with their choice and that they would do it again. 
and they've had measurable improvement in their quality of life. They're able to go about their jobs and go to their um, coffee meetings with their friends. They can go to the gym and jump rope and get back to their level of, of physical fitness. Um, they're able to simply laugh and not have to you know, squeeze their thighs and be afraid of having an accident. I'm sure that many persons who have um, tuned in um, are suffering from some of those um, problems. I do hope that that answers your question. Um, let us see if there are any other questions that have been submitted. So the next question is, how long after the procedure can I return to my daily activities? Um, it really depends on what you consider your daily activities, but the recovery period is almost negligible. If you consider going back to work daily activities, then you can do that by the very next day, especially if you have a desk job. There's no reason for you to miss any time from work other than the day of surgery. Um, when it comes to lifting heavy weights or jumping or very physical activity, I, would, I think it's reasonable to wait about two weeks or so for the healing or scarring uh, process to, um, to, to happen. But uh, certainly you can go for a walk by the next day or a couple of days later. Um, you, I also would probably uh, suggest avoiding intercourse for a few weeks, two weeks or so, um, mostly because the area might be a bit sore. And again, you may want to have the scarring tissue, the scarring process uh, happen unabated. Um, the next question from the, um, from the audience is what treatment would you recommend for persons who suffer from urgency and urge and urinary retention? Okay, well, those are two different um, problems, really. Urgency needs to be assessed. Um, what's causing the urgency? Is there a problem with the storage function of the bladder? The bladder basically has two functions, to store urine and to empty. And most persons who suffer from urgency, the most common underlying cause is overactive bladder. Um, you'd have to be investigated to make sure there's nothing else that's happening. But if you just have pure urgency from overactive bladder, the treatment is primarily one of um, medication and lifestyle changes. So the tablets that we, um, that we recommend are uh, anticholinergics, and they've been fairly successful. Uh, however, it, that does involve the taking of daily medication. And if that's not for you, or if conservative therapy has not helped, then what we would recommend is a Botox injection into the bladder. And that would be the next tier of treatment for overactive bladder. Uh, urinary retention is a talk onto itself. And I would just say that you'd have to treat the underlying problem when it comes to urinary retention, what is causing it. And um, yeah, that, that, that's an entire topic by itself um, beyond the scopes of this talk. Uh, I'd like to go on to the next question, which is can incontinence come and go? And generally speaking, stress urinary incontinence is something that most persons would experience daily. Um, maybe in its earliest stages, it may only affect you if you're doing certain um, very strenuous exercises like as it progresses, it gets worse. You'd be expected to feel or experience it daily with um, more trivial um, activities. So it would only come and go if you are in an early stage. But as um, things become uh, more severe, then you probably wouldn't have persistence of symptoms. Uh, the next question is, uh, where can we come and see you? Okay, it's a very useful question. 
My offices um, are in Kingston, Jamaica at 10 Ripon Road uh, at the Art of Surgery. My office number is 906-1284 or 906-1285. And um, you can get access to that information on the Instagram page, Advanced Urology. Or you can follow my tech where those details would be posted. Uh, unfortunately, um, someone is asking, am I available in Montego Bay? And I would say, no, I unfortunately am not. I'm based in Kingston. Okay. Um, one more question is, how can I manage my incontinence? So, as I've said before, that there are conservative ways of managing incontinence. And the first approach is to identify your underlying risk factors. If you, if you are obese, then weight loss would help. If you're a chronic smoker, that leads to coughing and that gives you incontinence and smoke cessation would help. It would also help with the um, strength of your support tissues and muscles to regain some of your um, natural natural support of the, of the urethra. Um, if you've got underlying uh, illnesses, addressing those like diabetes, malnutrition, um, or, or, or neurological disorders uh, is a way that you can manage your incontinence. Most persons um, would help themselves by just wearing pads. And it's, I think it's a bit sad if um, someone has to resort to wearing pads or diapers because the urine just gets trapped there. And you can even get, you can suffer from diaper rash as an adult, uh, which leads to its own skin complications. So it's really, it's really unfortunate that some people feel they need to suffer in silence and, and wear pads and diapers and um, resort to urethral plugs, which as I said, can have their own, their own uh, complication rates. The urethral plug can eventually erode the urethra, making it wide open and thereby making the entire problem even worse. And you're less likely to hold the urine on your own with that. All right, moving on to another question. <clears throat> Is incontinence more common in men, women, or children? Um, it's certainly most common in women. Uh, I, owing to the short length of the urethra, um, that doesn't lead, it doesn't lend to a lot of self um, in, in innate control of the urethra to close itself off. Um, a short tube is more likely to drip than a longer tube. So women tend to have more incontinence. Uh, childhood urinary incontinence is certainly very common um, and it's probably the most common of all, but um, that's a different kettle of fish that is due to more, um, to many factors, be it social, be it just behavioral, the child may not have been um, uh, toilet trained as yet, and it's just a matter of time before they get there. So I'm sure you appreciate that almost every woman, every child will experience incontinence, but in the adult population, it's more common in women. I get a lot of questions about home remedies and herbal medications and, um, and um, naturopathic treatment for most of the urological illnesses that I treat. And where this one is concerned, <clears throat> unfortunately, I don't know of any home remedies that have been described in the literature that have been studied scientifically that have been uh, shown inconclusively or in any way to treat um, incontinence. Um, the question goes on to ask, are there any home remedies that treat incontinence before surgery? And um, more, it's a question as to whether pelvic floor um, exercises or Kegel exercises improve the likelihood of success of a sling insertion. Um, that's something that I think still needs to be studied. Um, there's not much data on that. Inherently, you would think that it would because they kind of, you'd think they would act synergistically or one would improve the, the, the efforts of the other. And certainly in men who have had prostate surgery and 
who now experience incontinence after prostate surgery because their continence mechanism has been removed. Um, studies have definitively shown that those men who receive three months of pelvic floor muscle ex uh, strengthening exercises do better in terms of continence after surgery than those who do not have any training. So while it doesn't directly answer your question, um, one may be able to extrapolate and reason uh, and, uh, and suppose that it would improve the outcome of a sling procedure. I'm not sure if you would call that a home remedy, but it, I, I would consider that a conservative therapy. Um, another question is, can I do anything to prevent incontinence as I age? Um, aging, unfortunately, is associated with um, stress incontinence. As the support structures of the pelvis weaken, um, as you have had more and more in insults to your body as you get older, um, it becomes more and more prevalent, unfortunately. Some of the things that you can do are more related to a general healthy lifestyle. So um, staying fit, getting a good level of exercise, um, and making sure that you're, by that way your wound healing is not um, impaired. Uh, um, if, if there are other factors that, can, that are leading to your development of continence, like a chronic cough, addressing that. Um, good nutrition is always uh, a good idea. So staying away from um, too many um, fatty foods or a high fat, fat diet. Um, although there is no conclusive evidence that shows that the two things are related, that nutrition is related to incontinence. Um, I would think that uh, it's part of a healthy lifestyle and that persons who follow a what would be considered a generally healthy lifestyle are um, more likely to do better with surgery um, and probably would uh, um, address their incontinence at an earlier stage and seek help when it is mild and more likely to be um, successfully treated. Someone is asking, is there a correlation between prostate issues and incontinence? And uh, certainly there are. And um, patients who, for one, have had surgical intervention are more likely to have incontinence. So be it um, resection of the surgery of the prostate for an enlarged prostate or removal of the entire prostate for uh, cancer causes, um, then those persons are more likely to suffer incontinence. But even the person who just has um, lower urinary tract symptoms that is um, slowing of the urine because of an enlarged prostate, um, they can have what is called overflow incontinence, which means the, 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 the emptying of the bladder is impaired and the bladder empties incompletely. And over time, it just ends up being full and overflowing, sort of like a bucket of water. Um, and, and so the person, the patient will have continuous strippage of water and that's called an overflow incontinence. Um, Someone is asking, is incontinence a progressive problem? And I think we've addressed that. And I've said that it does indeed get worse or more common as you get older. And the natural history is that it progresses from mild to severe symptoms if left. So do you need to take care of it as soon as possible? Um, my feeling is that Persons with mild symptoms will do better with intervention, be it conservative therapy, um, be it medication, or be it surgery. The persons with mild symptoms will do better than those with severe symptoms. And um, it is possible that those with severe symptoms may fail one type of surgery and 
have to move on to another. And every time that you do a different approach, the complication rate can increase. All right. Um, I think that the questions are slowing down and I think we've really addressed all um, the questions that have come in so far. So I want to really thank you guys um, for your attention. Uh, I want to thank you for the time. I know that it's late in the evening and I'm taking you away from family time and your usual, um, your usual routine, but I'm really excited to have had the chance to talk to you about this because I know it's something that um, many, many people suffer from more than you would even imagine. Um, and the, the most concerning part is that, um, is that persons have been suffering in silence, not knowing that there's help and just think and thinking that it's just part of getting older. I must learn to live with it. And the truth is that that is really not so. Um, there is intervention. Um, so I want to thank you for your time, for your attention, for the opportunity to talk to you about something that I'm very passionate about. I want to thank Boston Scientific for providing the platform to have this discussion and for them providing um, their, their um, innovation and research into the equipment that we use to provide these procedures. I want to remind you that you can, I am available at, at the Art of Surgery on 10 Ripon Road, um, Kingston, Jamaica, 9061284 or 5. The website is Advanced Urology, A D V A N C E D U R O L O G Y dot com. Um, or you can access us through the MyTech Instagram um, uh, following. Um, so I do, I, I think this has been a successful first of many in a series that I plan on doing with Boston Scientific and also um, regarding urological conditions that are common. So um, thanks once again, and I do hope that you enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, and uh, thanks again to Boston Scientific and my tech medical for providing this platform. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much.